And we are just so excited that today, um, both uh, the Dominicans and um, the wonderful uh, people behind the Rosary Series are going to be sharing with you reflections on how to unleash the power of the Rosary. And they have a wonderful panel um, that will be uh, coming up here on stage shortly. I wanted to give you some housekeeping items um, just in terms of how to interact with this platform if you're not familiar with Crowdcast. Um, on the right side of your screen is the chat. Many of you are using that already and we'd love to hear where you're from, um, anything about you. If you want to share your own stories uh, about the power of the rosary as we're talking, we'd love to, for you to put that in that, in that chat um, area. And um, that's also where we'll be fielding um, some questions. And if we have time in the course of the hour, you can put those questions there and I will um, shoot them up to the panelists so that uh, they can answer those questions as they are able to. There's also a separate question uh, button on the right of your screen where you can directly put your questions in. Um, for the panel. So either place, either in the chat or in the question area, um, we'll be sure to get to them. If at any time during the course of the program you no longer can hear or see, um, simply refresh your page because sometimes the wonders of technology, those sorts of things will happen. Um, and we want to just make sure that you stay with us um, during this whole event. So we're so delighted that you're here. I want to introduce our amazing MC that we have for the event, um, Mr. Michael Gormley, who is a um, lay evangelist and apologist, um, has a, a wonderful podcast and works closely um, with the folks with Mysteries of the Rosary. So I'm going to let Michael take it away to lead us in um, a prayer and introduce our panel. And uh, we just are so happy that everybody's here and we hope you enjoy the hour. God bless you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, yes, like they said, my name is Michael Gomer Gormley. I am the mission evangelist at Paradisus Day, uh, which means that I do a lot of the traveling, talking, giving uh, giving presentations, doing men's conferences, helping out here and there with uh, marriage and family retreats and stuff like that. Also, uh, it, it's kind of interesting for me. Uh, it's a big transition in my own life. I've been doing parish-based ministry full-time for the last 17 years starting out in youth ministry and then going on to adult faith formation. Um, and so now stepping out into Paradisus Day and helping out, uh, doing all these wonderful talks and events like this, um, it, is, it is just a, like a dream come true for me to be able to do this full time. So uh, yeah, so today we have a great event. We want to unleash the power of the rosary. I can already tell by looking at the comments um, that have been flying by that uh, Y'all already love the rosary. And so what we're going to do is a deeper dive. We're going to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives, as well as our wonderful panelists that have agreed to come on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just think it's going to be a nice, beautiful way to kind of crown your day today. But before we do anything, let us start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Mm -hmm. God the Father, mercy, we bless you, praise you, adore you. We sanctify your holy and sacred name. Heavenly Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you. And through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, Lord Jesus, we praise you. We honor you. We thank you for your life, for your whole life is salvific. We thank you for your death on the cross for our sins. We thank you for your resurrection, for our newness of life that now is open. We thank you for your glorious ascension into heaven where you never stop interceding for us to the Father. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving us everything from that cross, from that empty tomb. You even gave us a mother, you who was the first disciple of yours, who was the best disciple of yours. So Mother Mary, we turn our hearts to you, given to us by your Son from the cross. Behold your mother. May we take you always into our home, just as we have given our hearts wholly over to Jesus Christ. May our hearts through your maternal intercession beat at one with your immaculate heart and his most sacred heart. Mother Mary, we ask for your intercession as we all pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Well, so happy 
that you're joining us today to unleash the power of the rosary in your life. We're here to answer your questions. We're here to talk about salvation and the gospel as it all relates to the beautiful rosary, this great tradition of Catholic prayer that we have, uh, especially through the hands of our uh, Dominican religious order and uh, all of those rosary warriors that are out there, lay people, priests, nuns, everyone who is committed to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for my first panelist, I want to bring out Sister Alexia. Sister Alexia is featured on the upcoming Joyful Mysteries of the Rosary. Paradisus Day is producing, uh, just in time for Advent, a wonderful series filmed in the Holy Land. And uh, her testimony, which is so beautiful about the rosary, is included in it. So, sister, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Michael. It's a joy to be with you all this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I'm Sister Alexia, a servant of the pierced hearts of Jesus and Mary. We are a religious institute founded in the Archdiocese of Miami by Mother Adela. And we have a particular charism that is a Marian charism. So we're called to be the living image and presence of Our Lady in the heart of the church. For me, it's a joy to be able to be a part of this Mysteries of the Rosary series, especially the joyful mysteries, because in a sense, like Our Lady, I can sing my own Magnificat and share what the Lord has done in my own life. Oh, that is awesome. I can sing my own Magnificat. What a great way to, man, you guys, religious orders, you got this stuff locked and loaded, right? Already, <laughs> already. It's so beautiful. Also joining us, we have uh, Father Aquinas. Father Aquinas is a member of the Dominican Friars. Um, Father Aquinas, good to see you. Good to have you on. Why don't you tell the folks a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. Yeah, Father Aquinas Gilbo. I'm a member of the province of St. Joseph, the eastern part of the United States. I'm uh, logging in from sunny and breezy Washington, D.C., where I'm also the university chaplain and director of campus ministry at the Catholic University of America. Not to be mistaken with any other Catholic university. This uh, is... No, definite wow. article the catholic unit i love it i love your order i love i love that eastern province um i'm friends i went to franciscan with uh oh man i feel like <clears throat> uh with good old uh gosh why am i blanking on his name he was he's gonna be on the pilgrimage why am i blanking on his name father gregory pine father gregory pine <laughs> sweet moses i could not think of his name i love Father. Gre <laughs> i literally just talked to him like a week ago <laughs> Oh man, yeah, uh, Father Gregory, what a, what a great guy! Your whole everything that you guys are, I love. You're just a powerhouse of 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 Dominican awesomeness. So thank you so much. Uh, also, also we have another uh, Dominican friar, uh, Father John Paul Kern. Uh, John, Father John Paul, come on in and join us today. He's the executive director of the Dominican Friars Foundation. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm Father John Paul Kern. Joy to be on with you today talking about uh, Our Lady's Rosary. As Michael mentioned, I'm the director of the Dominican Friars Foundation in New York and also our Rosary Shrine of St. Jude, which we have in Washington, D.C. I'm actually right across the street from Father Aquinas Gilbo at the Dominican House of Studies <laughs> um, as we're getting ready for the Dominican Rosary pilgrimage coming up on Saturday at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. So <laughs> lots of uh, exciting stuff going on here. Great to be with you. That's awesome. A lot of definite articles floating around here today. Um, yeah, so today we're, we're a panel here, and we want to uh, address, we want to talk about the rosary, we want to talk about the power of the rosary, um, you know, the Dominican tradition with the rosary, why they're doing the rosary pilgrimage, um, Sister Alexia's wonderful testimony and, and understanding the joyful mysteries of the rosary that Paradisus Dei is putting out. Um, I, I'm super excited about this conversation because a lot of Catholics, when you talk about prayer, Catholics think, I think, of two things, right? The Mass and the Rosary. And the Rosary has become such a powerhouse and a um, a meaningful part of so many people's lives, right? Uh, so many Catholics' lives. It's the center of their, not just Marian devotion, but when people say, like, pray for me, they're like, all right, I'm going to say Hail Mary right now. And we do this uh, uh, almost... Um, yeah, we do this almost automatically that these prayers, these these foundational prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, the Creed, have become woven into the very everyday life and thought of Catholics. Um, so I, I think I'll throw this question out first to the Dominican Friars. What is the Dominican history of the rosary? Can we talk a little bit about um, Our Lady and, and the special involvement of the Dominicans with the life of the rosary? Who's going to take that, Father John Paul or me? <laughs> You, we'll start, you go first. <laughs> yeah, we'll start with Father Aquinas. You know what? I should. I I always forget. Whenever you do a group call, you got to be specific because everyone's gonna be like, "Well, I'll let him go because I'm nice." 
No time well, to so, <laughs> so the order of preachers just has the privilege of, from our very beginning, beginning with St. Dominic himself, being dedicated uh, to Our Lady. Um, Our Lady shows up prominently in the life of St. Dominic uh, in terms of Dominic's inspiration for the order, but also the inspiration of the first preachers uh, from the very first generation, a devotion to Our Lady, uh, for example, singing the, the Salve at the end of Compline something that the Dominicans and that first generation developed and, and then handed off to the church. And it was soon after that, that the Dominicans uh, themselves also became, by papal decree, preachers of the rosary and which became part of the habit. And so, so dedication to Our Lady, fidelity to Our Lady. Uh, our Lady even f appears in our vow formula. We, we make vows to Our Lady, <laughs> vow of obedience to Our Lady. Um, this, this shapes the very soul of, of the Dominican order, and it's our, our blessing, to uh, our grace, really, to, to be able to preach and promote devotion to the rosary uh, as part of our, our, our observance and our religious life. How do you, what is, I've never heard of this, what is a vow to Our Lady, uh, to obedience to Our Lady, what does that look like in your, uh, in your kind of daily life there? No, so, so according to our vow formula, we vow to God, uh, to Blessed Mary, to Blessed Dominic. Uh, and the, the one vow that we do make, it's, it's the vow of obedience. So, so various Dominicans in different uh, parts of our, our history have reflected on this and commented on this. I think for, for me, uh, obedience to Our Lady in terms of, of religious life is, is really just imitation. I mean, just mm -hmm. a, a prayerful listening constantly uh, to her witness, uh, to the example that we see in the scriptures, but also uh, in the church's devotion to her um, and interiorly adopting her her posture, sister really talked about you know singing our own personal fiat. I mean that that's part of it. I mean it's that the uh, may it be done to me according to your word. Uh, that has to be the, the interior posture of all of us, uh, not least among us, the the Dominican, in terms of especially preaching the word, the external apostolate. It has its foundation uh, on that interior receptivity of, of of the word and of grace. So I think that's for me. That's how I. Uh, try to live out that 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 part of our vow. That's awesome. That's interesting, Sister Alexia. How does your order incorporate or, or draw from the life and strength and power of the Rosary? So just like Father was saying, Our Lady really is um, the first one who followed Christ closest in His own footsteps, and that's what all religious strive to do. Like He was saying, some communities profess a fourth vow, and so usually it's a reflection of the charism in our community. Mm. My mother foundress, Mother Adela Galindo, received the call to give birth to this institute through a Marian charism. And so for us, the religious sisters, we also have religious brothers and priests. But for the religious sisters, we make a fourth vow of total Marian identification and availability. Mm. So we are called to truly be that living image and presence of the person, the heart, and the mission of Our Lady. And so... It, in a concrete manifestation through our apostolic works, we don't have only one particular ministry of teaching or preaching, even though these are all very necessary, but we go wherever the church needs us to be able to live out the all-embracing motherhood of Our Lady. And so wherever our sisters are present, we are there with the heart, person, and mission of Our Lady to be able to bring her motherhood, her maternity, to all the souls. Oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, yeah. Father, uh, Father John Paul, how do you see or how do you leverage the power of the rosary as a tool of the new evangelization today? How have you seen it working? Mm. So uh, following up on our description of the religious life and Mary as part of these. So there are a lot of things that we are given from Our Lady to enjoy. But one of the ones that she particularly gave us to share with others um, is the rosary. And actually being back here in D.C. and reflecting upon my years as a student brother in formation, I remember every year we would go out and do sort of street outreach with the rosary in downtown Washington, D.C. And it's great because the rosary is it's a very identifiable thing. You know, we're not starting with a sort of, uh, hey, I would like to lead you into, um, you know, contemplative prayer, you know, just in, in your mind with your own words without something to latch on to. It gives people something to grab on to. Um, and it really focuses on very much on Jesus. You know, he's, we have the crucifix right there connected to the rosary. And it's sort of a, as, as you mentioned in your opening prayer, all of the life of Christ was saving, but in a certain way we see uh, 
at the moment of the cross is offering for us this supreme display of love. So to have this sort of concretized in a physical rosary that we can give to people and then teach them how to pray it, it's just this wonderful opportunity that, you know, Our Lady as a good mother, uh, she gives her children good things, including nice toys and other stuff to have. Um, <laughs> while, while, it, while it's like the most powerful spiritual weapon, we, we wear the rosary at our side where the sword would traditionally go. We recognize its power. At the same time, too, it's also very approachable. You can see like little kids grabbing a hold of this thing and not cutting themselves with it, but being able to start and little beginners in prayer, being yeah. able to open up and then get drawn deeper and deeper. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for evangelization. Yeah, for me, uh, as a layperson, right, I'm married, I have kids. Uh, my kids, I'm sure, are all psychopaths when it comes to prayer time. It's like, hey, we're going to sit down and pray. And they're like, well, Father, I know I've been sitting quietly on the couch watching television this whole time with you, but now is the time I rage, right? And so <laughs> trying to corral these 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 youths. I always look at my wife, and I'm like, these kids of yours. Uh, but the uh, how, how do we communicate the love of the rosary? For me was, I started simple. I didn't want to do, I, I always put so much pressure, right? We Catholics, we, we guilt trip ourselves so much. Uh, but I, it was like, okay, we tried to pray the whole rosary when they were like two, right? And it uh, didn't really work out so well. So what we just began doing was praying the Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be over and over and over again, that not only did they memorize the prayers, my one of my favorite moments was, my son, he goes in for his first communion assessment, and the lady sits him down. She goes, okay, do you know your prayers? And he's like, yes. And she says, okay, can you say a Hail Mary for me? And he goes, in English or in Latin? And I was like, boom, baby! Um, <laughs> mic drop moment. But uh, the rosary is such a beautiful prayer for families to say. I grew up, my dad was in the Knights of Columbus. He had his Black Knights of Columbus rosary. And we would lead it. Um, we have the scriptural rosary book. So we're memorizing scripture passages as we're praying through the mysteries of Christ's life through the eyes of the Virgin Mary, right? What could be better than that? We're saturated in the anointed word of God, praying this beautiful traditional prayer while meditating on the person of Christ through Mary. And it, it was so powerful. I attribute that to my reason why I'm still Catholic to this day. And when I got married, my dad walked up to me and he handed me his scriptural rosary book. And I opened it up and it said, Father Maurice, 1965. And that's who gave it to my dad when he got married. And uh, so, yeah, the rosary needs to be, I think, so much, uh, all the more so the center of family life. It's almost like, obviously, the laity are encouraged to pray the, the liturgy of the hours, but I find that the rosary almost becomes like the laity's version of that, this devotional life that can be scriptural, it can be meditative, it can be vocal if that's what you need. It can be simplified. It can be, Lord knows we all love to lengthen rosaries by adding 500 prayers at the end of every decade and stuff. I went to Franciscan, and depending on which household room you wandered into when they were praying the rosary, you got like 10 new prayers added on to the end. We're like, oh, okay, all right, here we go. Uh, Sister Alexia, let's talk about your vocation story a little bit as it relates to the rosary. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about the power of rosary in your own uh, journey to become a religious sister? Definitely. So I was born in El Salvador, a very Catholic country by culture. And so I always had images of Our Lady, of the Lord, and I had rosaries at home. But I always knew of them kind of as something that was just present. It wasn't really something that was so much a part of my life. Um, I do remember being a very young child and in my bedroom, I had a little statue of Our Lady. And whenever it was evening, so in Latin America, there's no AC in the bedroom, but when the breeze of the evening would begin to blow in, I would get my doll's blanket and cover Our Lady so she wouldn't be cold. <laughs> so um, this tenderness toward Our Lady was something that my family instilled in my heart since I was very young. But when I moved to the United States as a child, I was able to go to Catholic school for the first time. And this is where I share it in the Mysteries of the Rosary series, how it was truly through a teacher, Ms. Hartfield, as she encouraged. Oh, I think we lost your microphone there. Do you hear me? Oh, there you are. There you are. Right. Loud and clear. So, as I was, um, as I was saying, when my teacher encouraged me to have this person. Oh, oh, there you go. You're back. You're back. <laughs> okay. As my teacher encouraged me to have this personal relationship with the Lord that I really didn't know where to turn to because it seemed like God was so far away. I knew him as someone, kind of this old man in heaven taking care of me, but I didn't know that he was a person that I could have an encounter with. Mm. And so when I opened my heart to this encounter, 
immediately I just knew that I had to turn to his mother. And I remember I would go to church so confused about what the Lord was doing in my heart, not really understanding, but knowing that he was inviting me to something. And in that moment, I remember that I asked the Lord, Lord, if you want me to say yes to you, our lady said yes, but I don't know how to do that. But she has always been my mother. So just open one door through which mm. I can actually take one step. I'm not giving you my yes yet. I'm just giving one step. And at the end of Mass, Our Lady stood up and she invited all of us to a course for preparation for Marian consecration. I had no idea what that was, but it was Marian. So I knew that was the door Our Lady had opened. And it was in this course of preparation that we entered deeply into the responsibility of Our Lady, that she was totally free to say no. But knowing the responsibility that all of creation was waiting for her yes, she was able to say yes. And so I understood that my vocation wasn't just for me, that even though our vocation is personal in the plan of God, it's really for the good of many souls. And so it was through the power of the rosary, I began to pray the rosary every single day, asking her mother, give me your heart so that I can be courageous like you to say yes. It was through this um, praying of the rosary that after making my Marian consecration, I was able to give the first yes to the Lord. And in time then, my vocation began to um, grow in my heart and I was able to respond to all that the Lord was asking. And now in my religious community, one of the beautiful things that we have is that all of our sisters, like Father was saying, we wear the rosary in our habit as a sign of this Marian identification. But also all of our sisters are entrusted a living mystery of the rosary. So each one of us is given a rosary, one of the mysteries, and with it a virtue that we are called to in flesh in our lives. So for me, I have the fifth glorious mystery, the coronation of Our Lady. For my life, I'm called to make of my heart a sacred space where Our Lady can be free to place her reign. And like John Paul II would say to serve is to reign, as a servant of the pierced hearts of Jesus and Mary, I make of my life a gift of service so that Our Lady can be free to establish her reign wherever I'm present. And so the, the rosary was really the powerhouse that allowed me to have the courage to respond to my vocation. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah, the the beauty of the rosary, I don't think people realize like the the call of the rosary when we begin to authentically pray it, right? Takes us into the very depths of the mystery of God, right? We we understand not just that Christ is or that that God exists, right? But his his transcendence becomes close to us, right? He he condescends to us through Christ, right? Obviously at the incarnation, but in the praying of this rosary, we're meditating on the uh on, on the flesh and blood mysteries of his life, right? That he came for us, this, this beautiful movement for us. And it, it was, it, same thing for me, it was the praying through of the, uh, of the 33 day consecration that I understood the role of Mary, kind of honestly, for the first time, she was a statue, she was a painting, we prayed the rosary uh, very devoutly as, as family, but I didn't understand that notion of like taking Mary, you know, like Jesus says uh, from the cross in John's gospel, from that very hour, he took her into his home, I'm speaking of the beloved disciple. And it was like, yeah, I'm a beloved disciple of Jesus. So I need to have Mary as my mother. And I need to obey the word of the Lord and bring her into my house. And that means bring her into all that is me, right? And have her in this living, she, she always is gesturing and pointing to her son. Um, one thing, everyone listening, uh, we have some people in the uh, putting in questions in the chat. We encourage you to do that. We'll start going through them in a little bit. But uh, also, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, underneath um, underneath our beautiful and handsome images, uh, you will see these call to actions, these little green buttons down there. Um, register for the Joyful Mysteries, the Joyful Series uh, for Advent. If you click that, it'll take you to more information about exactly what Sister Alexia was a part of, these Joyful Mysteries that Paradisius Day is putting on. We want to help you in your campaign. We want to help you uh, you know, this Advent, maybe lead a rosary group or lead your parish in a study of the Holy Rosary for the Joyful Mysteries. It's a perfect companion for the Advent season. Um, so, yeah. So, sister, thank you so much for sharing. One of the things that um, stands out, I never heard of uh, taking on, like you took on probably one of the loftiest mysteries. You were assigned the loftiest mystery of the rosary. Uh, when you were first given that at your, you know, when, whenever they officially said you are the fifth glorious mystery, this is it. What, what, what did you think in that moment? Like, I mean, that's pretty epic, 
of all of all the decades. My favorite was Jesus as a child schooling the elders in the temple. But uh, yeah, no one ever awarded that to me. But uh, yeah, so what were you thinking? What was going through your mind when you were given that decade of the rosary or that mystery? So when my mother Fondres, um assigned me the fifth glorious mystery, for me it was a joy because all I truly want to be is a star in the crown of Our Lady. And I've always understood that. And so when I received that mystery, it was a great gift and also a great task. Um, in our community, we pray the rosary every day. And St. John Paul II is our spiritual father. So we're constantly entering into what he wrote in his apostolic letter on the Holy Rosary. Nice. That every time we pray the rosary with the heart of Our Lady, we're contemplating the face of Christ. And so he goes through all the different moments, right? Even from yeah. the Annunciation, the gaze of Our Lady was already fixed on the gate on the face of Christ, even though we she couldn't physically see him already, she was totally um, contemplating him. And then through every single moment of his life, but in the crowning of Our Lady, in that mystery, we can only imagine what it was the face that Our Lady was contemplating. So for me, it's it was um, a beautiful moment to receive that mystery, but also a very demanding call. And so that's simply what I try to say: Blessed Mother, in every moment, allow me to crown you. It's part of our life. We have a charism of love to the extreme. We're of the pierced hearts. So in every moment, we're called to make room for the triumph of the pierced hearts in every situation and every moment of our lives. And so that's just my prayer every moment. Lord, allow me to make this moment a triumph of your love so that I can crown Our Lady. So it's beautiful how um, as we pray the rosary, we really are living the life of Christ and we're entering deeply into each mystery. But it's not just to contemplate what happened. When Catholics make memory, we actualize the memory, right? So. In every moment that I'm living, whether it's a joyful, a sorrowful, a luminous, a glorious mystery of my life, contemplating Our Lady and the heart of Christ, we can really ask them, teach me how to live this moment of my life. For religious, for lay people, for young people, the rosary has so much to tell us as we discover the truth about what it is to live a Christian life. Yeah. I love this feminine spirituality. In all my years of being Catholic, I never would have conceived of it as, I want to be a jewel in the crown of our lady like that's such a that's such a beautiful image but the best part was when you mentioned that uh saint john paul was uh the spiritual father of your order father john paul was like yeah he started head bobbing you can see it you can see it going uh we'll come back to the the dominican friars here in a second but what we're going to do is we're going to throw it out to a trailer real quick and this is a trailer for the joyful mysteries of the rosary they'll be released on october 7th but they'll be available for everyone to um you know like like i said get a group of people together and understand the rosary you can find out more if you click the link at the bottom of the page the call to action there um but yeah we're gonna throw it out to this the the trailer for the joyful mysteries of the rosary when we come back we'll talk a little bit more about that and then we'll go further Jesus comes to bring us unending joy, and yet so many in our world are tormented and suffer with desolation and despair. The voice of God is no longer heard, and the quiet joy of God's love is no longer felt. The rosary is an antidote. It's a cure, a stillness, a silence. It's a rewiring of our hearts and our minds and there we will find unending joy. I hear a lot of times, oh, you know, nuns or sisters are so happy. You know, are you so happy? Our heart is first and foremost God. He is our one and only. What Christ comes to save isn't just uniquely the human family, but somehow this involves the, the whole matrix of, of the created order that everything leaps for joy. We all are looking for fulfillment. We're looking for a life of meaning, a life of joy. Only God can truly give us that. The God of the universe who could have chosen anywhere as his dwelling place has chosen your heart. Our Lady was the first to discover this joy, and she gave birth to the joy of the world. When we pray the rosary, we enter into the school of Mary, and she teaches us the secrets of Christian joy. This is the gift that our God wants to give us, a peace and a joy that surpasses all understanding. This joy is attractive, it's magnetic, it's contagious. Our world is desperately in need of a joyful Christian witness. In a world 
that's uh, every time I see a movie trailer, that's all I ever think of. In a world of brokenness, here was the rosary, right? So, uh, yeah, Paradisius Day, which uh, a lot of you may know, that man is you. They're the ones that are kind of uh, driving this beautiful. Uh, they wanted to make it cinematic. They wanted to make it historical. They wanted to make it grounded in the Holy Land. I had the great privilege of going to the Holy Land for the first time in October. And when I was talking with Mark, who you saw in the in the trailer, um, Mark was telling me that he was, you know, just got back from the Holy Land doing all this stuff about the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. And he's going out to do the joyful. And when I began to watch the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, uh, which I'm actually in, I totally forgot I was in. I was watching it with my kids and they're like, look, dad. And I was like, oh, oh, oh I did not do this on purpose. And no one's going to believe me. Um, but the it was so beautiful being in the Holy Land. And then now I'm watching the rosary, and he's walking you through all the places and the churches that are built over these where, where these historic events in our salvation uh, happened. And then seeing the joyful mystery. So the, the funny story for me was uh, by the time we got to Jerusalem, which is the last like four days of our trip, I was sick as a dog and never left my hotel room except going to the Holy Sepulchre and then running back. And uh, but the first part was all in Galilee, was all Nazareth. It was all the the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum and all this stuff. And so when the joyful mystery started coming out and I started seeing these things, I was like, oh, oh, I remember exactly what it felt like praying the rosary at the Church of the Annunciation. Right. I remember exactly what that was like. So um, taking this this moment. So, again, it's coming out uh, October 7th, but then it'll be available, like we said get groups together, get families. We're going to, I do a big potluck ministry. That's what I call, uh, or we call in, in that man is you the, uh, the liturgy of the table. So I'm a big guy of, of bringing in potlucks, big fan of it. I'm also a big guy, but big fan of bringing in potlucks, having families over. We have four families and it was 24 kids. Having Catholic friends is, is exhausting, but, uh, yeah. So fathers, um, go ahead, going out to the Dominican side of things. Um, you guys are sponsoring a Dominican rosary pilgrimage coming up on September 30th. Um, but before we get into that, I want to ask you, what is going on in terms of in terms of your own personal spirituality? How does Our Lady factor in? We'll start with you, Father John Paul. How does Our Lady factor in to your own devotional life? Like, what does it look like being devoted to Our Lady? Mm. So one of the things um, I learned from Our Lady, this was also very much through the rosary. So there are Hail Marys there. We're addressing her. We're asking her. Uh, to pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And so it was interesting. It started off as I'm, it's like I'm, I'm facing Our Lady. And, and in our chapel, we have this beautiful, called the Lady Lectern. Mary is seen pregnant with the word, an image to us of preachers being pregnant with the word before going forth to preach to everyone as she did at the visitation. But it's like I started sort of facing her and then as I was getting more and more into the rosary, it's like this turn happened where I realized then she was sort of pointing to her son and breaking out the scrapbook, as it were, of all these key events in her son's life. And as a mother, she's so excited to help me go deeper. And then so I'm focused then on Jesus. And it became sort of uh, now she's praying there next to me. And I, and I started to just realize all the ways it was almost the contrast at first where, for instance, at the Annunciation, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about something that like, oh, I need to say yes to God. OK, I'm going to. Yeah, kind of get ready. I Yes, I'll say yes to God. I know it's good for me. And I look to her and I see how much joy she has uh, when she said yes to God. I'm like, oh, that that's how you do it a little bit. more, <laughs> Right. You oh, know, grudgingly, um, stoically. That's that's the, <laughs> that's the image. Right. right. Or, 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 you know, like thinking about, you know, c carrying carrying my cross. Yeah. as it were, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to uh, embrace the cross here. And then I look and she's like, she was also suffering at the foot of the cross, but also in a certain way, just in a total trust, receiving all the strength she needs from God. And so it was like, she was teaching me all these important insights into the spiritual life, the way that she was living with Christ in these mysteries. And that really opened me up into the way that then I was to be transformed into the image of her son. Um, making contact with these different key moments in his life, these mysteries of the rosary that I was then being called to live out. She had already been there with him. And also she had, she had done this with the fullness of grace. And it was teaching me how to almost have a better posture in prayer and a better attitude towards God. Uh, so that's personally one of the ways that Mary, especially through the rosary really guided me in my spiritual life. 
That's awesome. Father Aquinas, what's it like in your work as the chaplain at the Catholic University of America? I mean, you're you're working with a lot of things that I get pushed back whenever I try to teach the rosary. Like, right, I was involved in high school youth ministry, middle school youth ministry. It's so boring. It's so boring. You just memorize and it's road and it's robotic and it's force. And it's like, listen, my wife has not yet gotten tired of me saying I love you. Right. She has not yet got tired. That's not a script that's ran, run cold in the old Gormley house. Uh, a lot of other things I do has, has definitely she's done with. But uh, <laughs> so what is it like in the actual work of, of chaplaincy uh, with with young adults? Yeah, here at Catholic University, we have the, the great grace of having uh, just off of our campus, uh, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. So we, yeah, no big deal. No big deal. This, Franciscan University has a cupcake shaped church and you guys have the National <laughs> Shrine right. Basilica. So everything that we do at Catholic is under the, the watch of the, the Blue Dome there right next to uh, Our Lady's house. And so that's reflected uh, yeah. in a lot of uh, just the 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 public devotion that we have on campus. Uh, we do have a daily rosary that's uh, led by the Knights of Columbus before our 510 mass at 445 every afternoon. We have a, a, a rosary and then the Knights kind of take charge of our Monday night mass uh, at 10 p.m. And before that, they're praying the rosary again. Um, but there's just general interest uh, yeah. in Our Lady. And I certainly now having Dominican uh, chaplains on campus uh, wear Our Lady's rosary, on our habit, uh, just that 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 Marian devotion, but I would just say Marian character, uh, you know, pervades everything that uh, that we do. And uh, and I have to say, I think our, our students, you know, get it, which is to say that that Mary is not a distraction from Christ. Uh, in fact, she's uh, only points to Him, and as many saints have said, she herself provides the the quickest and shortest path to Him. So. Um, so I think we, we incorporate that in a lot of our, our preaching and a lot of the pastoral care that we offer here uh, on campus. There is a, and it's been that way here at Seaway for, for a very long time. I mean, Our Lady just uh, yeah, has her imprint here. And many, 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 many have, have found her son through her, her guidance and, and protection. Can you tell us a little bit more, uh, Father Aquinas, about the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage that's coming up? So on this Saturday, uh, September 30th, uh, this is a, a venture of the Dominican Foundation, but also the, the province of St. Joseph, just to come to the shrine and to kind of call our nation to prayer uh, and to, to come to, to Mary's house, to come to the Basilica, to honor her, uh, to seek her intercession and in bringing us all closer to her son, particularly through uh, uh, just a day-long event where three Eucharistic adoration and confession, the celebration of Mass, but in the middle of the day, uh, a beautiful and solemn recitation of the Rosary. Um, we just want to, you know, revive, uh, you know, love for Our Lady, but particularly devotion to her through the Rosary uh, as a way of drawing close to her son. So uh, it's exciting for us uh, at Catholic University to have the, the pilgrimage, in a sense, coming to us. Uh, we don't have to pilgrim very far uh, <laughs> to get there, but uh, Father John Paul and his team uh, in organizing this uh, and bringing parishes from around the country together this weekend to, to pray, it's going to be a great event. So what should people do who can't make the pilgrimage? Well, they can absolutely participate um, in prayer, and also they can enjoy the live stream. So if they go to our website, rosarypilgrimage.org, They'll be able to see a live stream of the entire day's events, uh, all of the talks, the prayer as well, and sign up for more information uh, about going deeper in their devotion to Jesus through Mary in the rosary. So happy to include pilgrims from across the country that are not able to make uh, the far trip to be there with us at the event physically. Uh, we enjoy them to participate. We invite them to participate spiritually uh, with us. <laughs> and, <as well>. digitally. <laughs> and digitally. And digitally. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. I mean, we think about this, like Sister Alexia, you, you know, we're all on different parts of the country. We're able to share. We got 500 plus, 600 plus people on uh, watching this crowdcast. Like technology is amazing to get the word out and to get us uh, connected to one another. One of my favorite uh, lines was, I think it was from a Harvard sociologist, um, the guy that wrote Bowling Alone. He was talking about digital friendships. And he said, if it's begun in real life, then digital technologies 
keep the connection alive, like writing letters. If it's begun online, then it can fade because it's too much of a um, of a. I, I get to click you away, right? I can just, I can just, you just fade out and all this stuff. But the other side of it is something like this, where people literally from all over the country. I think I saw some people out, you know, people in Canada. Um, they're able to come and hear all of these voices. And be able to connect with Our Lady and have their lives moved by the message of the gospel. Uh, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited for Carmel Communications putting this together. Um, and so we got the live stream coming up for the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage. Uh, you can click the um, call to action button there at the bottom, uh, and that'll take you to register so you can see it. Um, the, the glorious thing that we want is to get as many people praying the rosary together as a nation, as a people, um, on, on September 30th. I think that's awesome. Uh, one of the things we're going to do now is we have a trailer uh, that the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage has. We're going to show that here in a second. Um, and so, yeah, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we come back uh, from this trailer. In a world. <laughs> In a time of widespread confusion, the Holy Spirit raised up St. Dominic to found a new religious order for preaching and the salvation of souls. Our Lady entrusted the Rosary to the Dominican Order to shine the light of Jesus Christ throughout the world. The Rosary contains the whole of Christian faith in all its splendor, given to us that we may fill our minds with it relish it, and nourish our souls with it. In times of great need, Our Lady herself and numerous popes and saints have called for Catholics to gather together and pray the Rosary. On September 30th, 2023, the Vigil of Rosary Sunday, we will gather together to celebrate the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Come together with Christ and Our Lady. Join us for the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage. All right, that's awesome. Yes, join in a world of confusion. <laughs> we have the rosary. Yeah, I love it. Sister Alexia, um, I have a question for you. What are, and I know you've, you've answered this through the lens of your religious order. Imagine someone's coming up to you and they're on the struggle bus with their relationship with God. How does Mary help us to follow Jesus? In every possible way. <laughs> but I think that one of the key um, characteristics of Our Lady's mission in the heart of all of humanity is really just her maternal love. You know, many times we can approach faith as something just through reason mm -hmm. or something that I need to understand and appropriate and follow these laws. But somehow Our Lady has this capacity given to her by God because she is the Immaculate Conception, right? So everything in her is just a single movement of love that we might not even know Christ, but when we encounter Our Lady, she has this capacity to go melting the heart. And so in such a world that is so hardened by sin and so many difficulties that we all are encountering, speaking of even about young adults, um, in our own ministry, we have seen that, that we're trying to, to spread the beauty of the faith and the encounter that we've had, but there's sometimes so much resistance just because of how hardened our world is. And so Our Lady has, she enters like a little tea light in the midst of so much darkness. It's a very <laughs> simple tea light, but her presence warms the room and it illumines it. And so when she's present, she introduces this um, tenderness that the human heart can't resist. And so Our Lady really is kind of like the secret weapon of God that he sends. And we see it even in our current history, you know, through so many Marian apparitions. Our Lady is appearing and she is always calling us back to God, always calling us back to scripture, to the sacraments, to confession, the Eucharist, but with so much maternal love that the human heart just can't resist. I love that because one of the things that I think is happening in our Catholic faith today is, is uh, bear with me here, we've softened so much of Christianity. The you know Pope John Paul talks about in Catechesi Tridende that when you're teaching young people, teach them the full rigor and vigor of the Catholic faith. 
And it's like, yeah, but if we teach the full rigor, they'll ditch it. And then they don't get to the vigor. They don't get to the life-giving aspect of it if they ditch it. And so the, the thing is like, this is a call to sacrifice. This is a call to live a different and sometimes difficult life. But the difference is because we're living the life of Christ, there's always great joy, even in the sorrows, even in the troubles, even in the carrying of the cross. And so when I'm trying to get people to understand this, to me, I, I think of that scripture passage, right? So uh, Jesus says, uh, a, a smoldering wick I will not quench, a bruised reed I will not break. And I think about that in times of today where so many people are hurting. Jesus doesn't come in like a lamb, like a lion to destroy you and like, you know, toughen up. He doesn't do that. If you're already a bruised reed, he comes in right as this lamb, as something meek, right? And I think the Marian devotion side shows exactly the tenderness of the faith that we have, right? It reveals us this like tender loving care that only a mother could have and express. And then we see it in the actual ministry of Jesus over and over again. One of my favorite passages in Luke, I read through it and you don't even notice it, but it's like he goes to Peter's mother's, mother's in-law house, right? Mother-in-law's house. And he goes to heal her, right? Or he heals her. Note, Peter never asked him to. I'm just saying he never asked him to. It's a mother-in-law situation. It was a mother-in-law joke. Didn't go over well. Uh, but he heals her. She gets up and she begins working, uh, serving them. And then it says that uh, Jesus' people came to his door at sundown, and he healed them all night long. And then at sunrise, he goes off to pray. Right. So th- he has literally been up for like 24 hours healing people, working with Like that's the tenderness of our God that sometimes – in this idea of like the pendulum swinging too far the other way. Oh no, now we got to tell people to man up and toughen up, which is a lot of rhetoric you hear this masculine Christianity stuff, um, which I'm all in favor of, right? Because then Christianity just becomes self-help. But to those of us, everyone goes through lives where we become these bruised reeds, I think. And sometimes our image of, of the loftiness and the grandeur of God can, can scare us from seeking. And I've had people say this, I'm so broken. Why would God want me? It's like, oh, you don't, you you don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. You don't know, you don't know our Lord. And Mary serves as like this living icon of a reminder of the tenderness of God. He stooped down to request of a virgin, right, in Galilee, a teenage girl, um, to be the to be the God bear, right? Um, Father John Paul, how would you answer those who are squeamish about Mary and devotion? I was talking with a Protestant gentleman the other day, and he said, you know, I think about this stuff. And I feel like any attention praying to Mary, that's reserved for God alone. Is this like worship? How do we talk about this with those who who are Christians but might be squeamish about this Mary stuff? Well, as a convert myself, I went through such a phase. Oh um, yeah, where'd you convert from? What, 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 what was your what was your history? I was I was baptized Lutheran, but I would say I was sort of non denominational evangelical through high school and college. Gotcha. And. Uh, there, there was a certain moment where, you know, for me, some of the church's teachings, such as the Eucharist, were such that, you know, if this is true, I can't really stay away. I want to be with Jesus. But his mother plays an important role, and she seems to play an important role that is more important than I understand. And part of it is the rosary. So I remember wrestling with this. And again, there's a good sense of not wanting to commit idolatry, not wanting to worship anyone other than God. And so I think the the two keys for me were one, understanding Mary's intercession and the intercession of all the saints, because there are times where I'd be going through a hard time as a Protestant, and yet I would absolutely uh, go to one of my friends in faith and say, hey, can we we pray together? And there was something important about that. Of course, I could pray to God by myself. There's something about asking them to pray for me, to pray together. And when I understood that the church was not just those who are currently traveling on pilgrimage on earth, but those who are also in heaven. Yeah. Well, to apply that to them as well, I was like, oh, well, of course, those closest to God, I want to pray with them and I want them to pray for me too. Uh, that was huge. And also seeing in the gospel, um, yeah, certain instances in Mary's life. So like the wedding feast at Cana, for example, right? Um, she's not turning anyone away from her son there. She's uh, she's interceding on their behalf. Not a bouncer is what you're saying. <laughs> no, not a bouncer, not a distractor. In fact, she she is the one who, you know, she sees people's needs and is like, oh, um, this couple is is in crisis. Who can solve this? Oh, yeah, my son can definitely do this. Well, let's connect them. That's such a motherly thing to do, um, you know, making connections like that. 
Uh, she's going to lead us to Jesus, uh, intercede on our behalf for him to give us the things that only he can give that we need. And then her final instruction, you know, do whatever he tells you, uh, a good basic motherly instruction, but again, pointing us back to Jesus. So nobody wants you to know and love Jesus more than the Blessed Virgin Mary. So she is not one to be afraid of all of her, all the graces she's been given, all of the beauty that she has is always, you know, you see this in the images of her holding Jesus. She catches your eye, but it, it, it draws you right to her son. And that's, that's who she is. So be not afraid. Oh, that's awesome. Father Aquinas, what would you say to those who are hesitant about marrying devotion that it, that, um, you know, it, especially in terms of worship, right? Like prayer is for God alone. How dare you exchange the glory of God for a creature? What what would you say to them? Yeah. So I'm, it's just to repeat what you just said, <laughs> you know, Christians worship God alone. Uh, and so, uh, all of the the worship, the adoration that 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 we lift, uh, that we offer in prayer, has one object: God, who is and who reveals Himself to us. Um, anything else in terms of the spiritual life is is an aid to that. Yeah. You know, uh, whatever friendship we have with the saints, uh, whatever friendship we have with Our Lady, and devotion that we show to her has as its object not just that. It doesn't. Our devotion to Our Lady does not end there. Uh, but has as its purpose, as its object and goal, the, the worship of God. And so uh, I would say that what, what the Christian does, what the Catholic does in drawing close to Our Lady, especially in praying the rosary, is we want to imitate her in her own discipleship with the Lord. You know, we want to see what she sees. We want to think what she thinks, feel what she feels as the, the mother of the Lord and the, the first disciple first and perfect disciple of the Lord. Uh, everything in Mary and devotion, everything that uh, that the rosary offers us has that yeah. as its goal. It, it's to know God, to worship God um, in a way, well, I mean, to, to, to approximate the, the very adoration and worship that Our Lady gave to him. Yeah. As the mother of the Lord, as she who, who saw the Lord, you know, physically face to face, held him in her arms, followed him, stood beneath him, uh, beneath the cross and and was with the church uh you know in those days of the resurrection so you know it's 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 her we seek to imitate it's, it's her her virtues her her graces her merits that we want to benefit from uh so that we might know her son and love her son and follow her son as she did i mean that's the that's, that's the heart of, of it all that's not like really yeah. the goal there's it's not much more, yeah. more complicated than that and uh and we see all kinds of examples of that in just normal life. There are people that we want to imitate because why? Well, because we want what they have. You yeah. Know? And, uh, yeah. and so that's what we want with our lady. We, we kind of, in a sense, want what she has and she's there as a loving mother, ready to give it to us. Whenever I work with Protestants to try to get them to see the value of Mary and a Marian devotion in their life, um, I, I follow the line of Frank Sheed. If you're familiar with him, Australian spent most of his days, most of his days in London, just street evangelization and Hyde Park and all this stuff. And he wrote a lot of books. Basically, he wrote one book in varying lengths. Uh, <laughs> Map of Life, Theology for Beginners, Theology and Sanity, um, To Know Christ Jesus, What Difference Does Jesus Make? They're all phenomenal books. But when he talks about uh, how to talk about Our Lady and the Communion of Saints, he says, don't start with God and like, oh, so we worship God, but we honor the saints. He said, "You'll your Protestant interlocutor will always keep this competition, this competitiveness mm -hmm. between God and, and the saints or objects or whatever it is. He said, start with this simple thing that every human being honors that which is honorable, mm -hmm. right? We honor that which is honorable, right? And I always talk about the, the statues of the Marines at Iwo Jima, right? You know, they're raising the flag and no one goes to the, uh, the U.S. Marine Cemetery and goes to that statue and worships the statue we see that the statues honor the very moment that our country wishes us to imitate, right? The heroic, you know, bravery of these men who went and fought and liberated Iwo Jima. I mean, like the crazy, my, my grandfather was in the Pacific theater and he was on a battleship to help take Marines and cover Marines who were doing these Island hoppings and the, the stress and the violence and the tornado or the, uh, the, the, the um, storms that they went through all the craziness to do this. And it's like, no, we honor that which is honorable, right? Give honor to whom honor is due, St. Paul says in Romans. And so when we look at Our Lady for Catholics, 
I, I, my whole life, I've been surrounded by Marian statues. I never once thought I worship that statue or I worship Mary, who that statue symbolizes. The whole time I thought, this is a beautiful heirloom that honors my mother. Just like a bust or a statue of the founder of your university in the front of, you know, campus. Of course, for Catholic universities, probably Our Lady again. But, uh, you know, like we have these, these things that they call to mind, as St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That the very best of us, the very best of the very best of us, this is who they are. This is what they did. And the things like the rosary, things like statues, things like dedicating places of honor. We do it at public schools for crying out loud, right? We name them after, you know, football fields in memoriam because we want these people to be remembered. What better to honor someone than for following Jesus the closest? And so I said to this one guy who's a Reformed Baptist student, he's like, I just struggle. I don't like it. It's so hard. And I said, Jesus wants you to take his mother into your house. What's wrong with that? And he's like, well, when you put it that way, okay. <laughs> it's like, okay, that was it. That was all it took for him. So, uh, yeah. So, once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Sister Alexia, I just want to ask you a quick question. If someone wants to begin, obviously we can say just pray the rosary, but if someone wants to begin Marian devotion, uh, what would you encourage them to do? What would be like your, your final thoughts for our audience today? I will share something that is a tradition in our community. It's actually part of our daily duties. Nice. Each one of us sits 15 minutes before an image of Our Lady. And so in those 15 minutes, our mother founders invites us to contemplate her, to discover truly her person, her heart, her mission, but always since her childhood, my mother founders, Mother Adela, she would write on her desks at school, mother, whoever sees me, may they see you. And that was always her motto as a child. Never did she imagine that the Lord would invite her and call her to found a religious family. But for us now, that is our motto as well. All for the heart of Jesus, through the heart of Mary, but personally, Mother, that whoever sees me may see you. So that's a beautiful um, thing that you can do every single day. Just sit before the image of Our Lady, because there's a reason we have images. Images communicate so much. Our faith is a faith of incarnation. Our God became man. And so when we can contemplate these statues, when we can contemplate the images of Our Lady and the variety of the different apparitions and devotions, we can actually discover the truth about her heart. So that's one way that we can enter into our relationship with the Lord. Yeah, that's awesome. And to think that the flesh, the body of our Lord was derived from, you know, to put it simply, the DNA of Our Lady. Like, how beautiful is that? Um, all right. So to conclude today, we have, again, the Rosary Series. You want to see that at the rosaryseries.com. You can hear Sister Alexia's story in the Joyful Mysteries. We also have the rosarypilgrimage.org this uh, Saturday, September 30th. Join uh, the friars as they lead this. Father Gregory Pine and some others will be giving uh, wonderful talks. They'll be praying solemn rosary. You can watch it on the live stream. But if you're anywhere near the D.C. area, come on in and join the pilgrimage. Good deal. Thank you all so much for coming here. Father John Paul, Father Aquinas, Sister Alexia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing uh, the power of the rosary in your life and in your in your religious life and all that wonderful thank you thank you thanks for all your work thank you mike and god bless you go cool. <laughs> and everyone out there thank you for coming thank you for tuning in god bless y'all